Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second keynote session. My name is Xiao Li Li and will serve as a facilitator. Paloma Glaciani Picado will help monitor chat and Q&A. Throughout the presentation, please use Q&A to submit your questions. It's a great honor for me to introduce today's keynote speaker, Lauren Klein. Lauren is an associate professor in the Department of English and Quantitative Theory and Methods at Amara University, where she also directs the Digital Humanities Lab. Before moving to Amory, she taught in the School of Culture, Media, and Communication at George Tech. Lauren works at the intersection of digital humanities, data science, and early American literature with a research focus on issues of gender and race. Today, Lauren will talk about data feminism, which is a way of thinking about data science and its communication that is informed by the past several decades of intersectional feminist Arcanism and critical thought. We believe Lauren's intersectional approach to data science will be key to challenge participants and inspire the community of linked data practitioners to reflect on topics of knowledge representation, labor, ethics, and accountability inherent to the process of linked data publishing and consumption. We are thrilled to have Lauren with us here today. Lauren, now it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelly, for that nice introduction. Thanks also to Paloma and to Michelle for this invitation. Uh, it's great to be here. I was saying to Michelle, we got we signed in a little bit earlier, um, right after grad school, which at this point was a very long time ago. But um, I my first ever professional event was a digital humanities workshop called From Metadata to Linked Data. And I flew from then uh, the CUNY Grad Center to uh, Trinity College, College Dublin to take a one week seminar on linked data. So it's nice that everything comes full circle, um, at least virtually, if not uh, physically. And um, I get to talk to all of you all today. So I am going to uh, share my screen here. Oops, that's sideways. Let's move it to the right spot. Okay. And uh, can everyone see this? Does this look okay? Uh, Shelly, is this good? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so I guess I'll get started. And I did wanna begin by saying that while I myself am one person, uh, the work that I'm going to be presenting on is actually co-authored work with Catherine D'Ignazio, who's an assistant professor of urban science and planning at MIT. Um, you can see her up on the screen. And the other thing that I will say uh, before getting started is, you know, I'm gonna do a little bit of summary about the project and some of the things that we say in the project's most significant expression, which is this book that you see here. Um, but the book is also available online uh, open access through this uh, URL datafeminism.io. If you go there and you click the link, then it will take you to, there's a button that says read now, it will take you to the book. So if you wanna learn more about uh, anything that I say today, that's where I would direct you. So I'll be, be, begin by saying that we see data feminism as a small part of a much larger body of work that is working collectively to hold corporate and government actors accountable for their sexist, racist, classist data products. So you could think of face detection systems that can't see women of color, hiring algorithms that demote applicants that went to all women's schools, child abuse detection systems that punish poor parents and more. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see some of the projects that have done the work on these particular issues that I just named that really compelled uh, Catherine and myself to 
do the research that resulted in this book. Because these examples, they just keep on coming. Um, you know, in the pandemic, we've seen even more. There was the A-levels fiasco in the UK. Um, we've seen all these disasters related to remote proctoring systems that fail to see people with dark skin. I mean, really every week, there's another headline with the same outcome in the article. And what it comes down to is a contradiction or a discrepancy that is sort of summarized by these two large quotes that you see on the screen. So corporations for the past decade or so have seen data as the new oil. Um, this is a phrase I think we've all heard. Um, when corporations use this, they mean this in a good way, in that data seems to them to be this you know, untapped natural resource that can lead to tremendous profit once you figure out how to process and refine it. Uh, but women, and particularly women of color, as well as indigenous people, immigrant communities, LGBTQ folks, and more, experience this very same process of data extraction. Because if you're talking about oil, that's really the operative metaphor here. Um, it's just another instance of the same old oppression. And, you know, Catherine and I are by no means the first ones to have made the case that this oppression is real, um, that it's ongoing, and that it's really necessary to dismantle. And actually, what we do in our project is explain how feminism and intersectional feminism in particular has been focused on precisely this issue on dismantling instances of oppression and the forces of power that caused them for a very, very long time. So what I'm gonna do in my talk today is uh, give you a little bit more of a background into some of the terms that I'm using, like feminism, intersectional feminism, even a little bit about data. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the principles that we developed uh, for the book, which are what we see as a way of structuring feminist work with respect to data. And then I'm gonna run through a couple of examples that show how you might take these principles, which are fairly sort of conceptual and heady. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm just seeing a question right here. Okay, the title at the bottom there, that's uh, it's called indigenous data. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of uh, how we take these principles and we apply them in our own work or how they're already being applied in the moment. So um, to sort of jump right in, uh, feminism. What do I mean when I use this term? So what you're looking at is an image from the 2014 MTV Music Awards. This was when Beyonce projected the word feminist behind her. This is because she sings about feminism in a song called Flawless. This was the title track of an album that was released that year. And in the song, she samples what turns out to be the American Heritage Dictionary definition of the term. So you hear Beyonce, or rather a sample, um, say feminist the person who believes in equal rights for men and women, to which Catherine and I add necessarily non-binary people as well. So what we get from this definition, a really basic definition, is that feminism at its core entails a belief in equality. So you also get a second definition from the dictionary, which is organized activity on behalf of women and non-binary people's rights and interests. And this comes about due to the reality that, you know, if you look around you, you see that this goal of equality is not yet realized in the world. So feminism, again, must also necessarily involve political action or organized activity in order to achieve or strive towards the equality that we want to see. And then feminism has a third definition, which is a set of theories and ideas. Um, so these theories began by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. But, you know, there's been 40 years of scholarship, there's been 40 years of, you know, reality. Um, and what these two things have done together, uh, what, ha what they've done is brought many, many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation. So these include race, these include class, these include sexuality, ability, and more. So this brings me back around to this idea of intersectional feminism. And in ha our view, and this is what we say in the book, um, feminism right now in the year 2021 must be understood as intersectional. 
And I think many of you may know because intersectionality is a term that is often bandied about even in popular discourse. Um, this is a term that was coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, which she uses to explain how social inequality cannot be described in terms of only one dimension of difference like gender. So if we're talking about inequality or oppression, we have to be talking about the intersection of the many factors and forces that produce it. So again, racism, classism, colonialism and so on. So the one key thing to understand about intersectionality, and this is actually a thing that's often overlooked in these casual invocations of the term, is that intersectionality doesn't just describe markers of individual identity. Um, so it doesn't just mean like I, you know, Lauren Klein, I am, I am white, I am a cisgender woman, I live in the global north and the US south. Like it doesn't just mean these identity aspects of me. What it is describing, are the structural forces of power and their intersection that make those aspects of my identity or the groups with, with which I affiliate, make those aspects of my identity matter um, that produce instances of privilege on the one hand or oppression on the other. And it's been the work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular that have really shifted the conversation. I almost think of it as like a rack focus if you're a visual kind of person, thinking about the shift from thinking about identity to thinking about root causes, thinking about forces of power. So in short, Intersectional feminism, which gives us the underlying framework for data feminism, isn't only about issues of gender or even only about women. It's actually about power. It's about who has it and who doesn't. And in today's world, data really is power. So you see this in the idea of data as the new oil. Um, and you also see this in the idea of data as the same old oppression. And so intersectional feminism, when applied to data science, can help that power be challenged and changed. So our argument in a nutshell is that data science needs feminism and actually like needs it kind of badly um, if we ever hope to overturn these power imbalances. So in undertaking this project, what Catherine and I did was sort of sit down and ask ourselves, what have we learned from all of our schooling and feminist scholarship? our participation in various activist communities, um, you know, the other things that we've gleaned from different disciplines and fields in which feminism has been applied. And we came up with these seven principles that to us encapsulate the most important aspects of feminism as they relate to data. Um, and you can see them right here, examine power, challenge power, rethink binaries and hierarchies, elevate emotion and embodiment, embrace pluralism, consider context, and make labor visible. And our goal with these principles in general um, was really to operationalize feminism for a data science. So to provide concrete models that might guide the work of people working with data or who want to work with data or people who want to refuse to work with data for personal or political reasons. And in the book, we actually have one chapter devoted to each of these principles where again, you know, we talk a little bit about the feminist theory that's underlying it and then explain how this can be enacted with recourse to you know, dozens of examples and every once in a while, a, a, we hope a funny joke. Um, but as I mentioned before, what I wanna do in this talk is not actually run down the list of principles and give you examples because we don't have enough time for that. What I want to do is pull out some examples that actually touch on multiple principles at the same time, just so that you get a sense of what we mean by operationalizing feminism and applying it to data science. And also to give you a sense of how we see this, again, as I said before, sort of already playing out or already being enacted in you know, practice, if not by name, uh, in, in the real world. So in the book, we talk about projects like Mimi Onuoha's Library of Missing Datasets. Uh, we actually talk about this project pretty early on in the book. Um, missing datasets is a term coined by Onuoha to describe datasets that a reasonable person might expect to exist because they address issues of pressing social, political, economic need. Um, but because of various reasons, they don't actually exist in real life. So you get data sets like trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime. There's no national comprehensive database on this. Uh, people excluded from public housing 
because of criminal records. This is another data set, missing data set, which Onoha wishes would exist because it's actually a real issue, but no one has taken an interest in collecting data on this. Or, you know, I think right now we are experiencing the sort of the effects of a lot of missing data sets with COVID, right? We, for a very long time, did not have national comprehensive data sets on any number of issues related to the pandemic. First, you know, the number of cases, the number of deaths of people with COVID, especially when you take into account gender and race. Right now, we're still missing granular data on how vaccine rollouts are going in different counties, among different groups. Um, and these data sets are missing for a reason, right? They're missing because of a lack of personal, political, or you know, cultural, social, economic will. And this is the point that Onuoha wants to make. You know, if you had to generalize, the reason why these data sets are missing is because of this profound imbalance of power in the world, um, especially with respect to data collection. So this imbalance of power is what determines what data are collected and what data are not. Um, and then in turn, what research is conducted and what research is not. So, you know, who has this power? Governments have this power. Moneyed institutions have this power. But generally speaking, minoritized groups do not. And so this is why a feminist approach to data science must begin with an analysis of power. Because far too often, the data sets that we can access, and then in turn, the questions that they prompt, have already been affected or in a way overdetermined by this imbalance of power in the world. So what you're looking at here is actually another case of missing data sets. Um, it has to do with the issue of feminicide. Um, so feminicides are gender-related killings of women and girls. Um, they include both cis and trans women. They are legally defined as crimes in a handful of countries, including Mexico, um, which is the where this example comes from. But the state does not systematically collect data on feminicides. Um, and I should actually say they're also the subject of emerging and in growing public anger in Latin America. There's actually a hashtag ni una menos, which you can check out on Twitter and you can see how activists are mobilizing around this issue right now. Um, and they're primarily frustrated in, with the way that the state has neglected to fully implement their own laws and provisions. So in the book, we tell the story of one of these activists named Maria Salguero, um, and she resolved to sort of head straight towards this problem of missing data and collect it herself. So she spends two to four hours per day logging feminicides on this Google map that you see, which she calls from media reports. And as a result of this work, which has been going on for years, she has single-handedly compiled the largest archive of feminicides in Mexico. She's helped families locate loved ones. She's provided journalists and NGOs information. She's actually been called to testify in front of Mexico's Congress multiple times in response to their own lack of action. And in the book, we talk about this as a form of what might be called feminist counter data. So this whole method or approach of activist data collection that steps in when the state or other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their population. So this represents um, a really important way, but an also an accessible and you know, relatively doable way of using data to challenge power. So it's interesting that so many projects that we discuss through the lens of data feminism actually begin as counter data collection efforts, because as I was saying before, very often these issues have just been ignored by the data collectors. And so the starting point often is, well, we have to have data before we can do something about it. Um, but in the book, we actually talk about this particular project uh, with respect to a different principle, which has to do with embracing pluralism. So what you're looking at is a map created by the group called the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. They're based out of San Francisco. 
And since 2013, the AEMP has worked in collaboration with tenants' rights organizations and community groups um, in order to collect and map data about the eviction crisis in the Bay Area. And I know there are some people from the Bay Area um, on the line, so I probably don't need to get into the details of this, but essentially, right, uh, Silicon Valley in the Bay Area, tech workers make a lot of money, everyone else does not. Landlords have figured this out and they figured out that they can evict their longstanding tenants, they can charge a lot more rent to the new tech workers. So what you're looking at on the map is for each of these red dots, it indicates a place where a person or a family has been evicted. Um, the blue dots indicate places where the AEM, the, excuse me, the AEMP, as they are known, um, has also interviewed one of the people who is in the process of being evicted from their home or who has been evicted. And if you click on one of the little blue dots, you get um, a video like you see on the right of this is a Midtown resident named Phyllis Bowie. And we can draw a really sharp contrast between that AEMP map that you were just looking at with the work of the eviction lab, which is based at Princeton. So the eviction lab's goal is to present a national picture of the eviction crisis. And you know, on its own, this is a worthy goal. It's actually a really valuable project, but it's wildly different in terms of process. So you might take a look at this map and think, hmm, you know, I'm, I think I'm looking at bigger data. Um, I think I'm getting a more comprehensive picture of what's going on across the United States. I'm certainly looking at a map of a larger territory, right? Um, you might take a look at their methods and think, oh, I think it seems more rigorous, right? Like it looks a little bit more scientific or official. But what the AEMP has shown is that national real estate databases like the ones that the eviction lab uses significantly undercount evictions. And you can think again, you know, why this might be true. You know, first of all, the real estate industry, you know, not incentivized in any way to count more evictions than they have to. Um, that's bad for business. You can also think about all of the different ways that you can be evicted from your home that don't involve being served with a formal eviction notice of the type that is recorded in the, the national database. Um, you know, your landlord can like not fix the leak in your ceiling. They can lurk in your lobby. They can raise your rent a lot. They can refuse to answer phone calls when your toilet is broken. Like all of these things are ways to get you out without officially evicting you through the letter of the law. And because the eviction, uh, excuse me, the AEMP works with local community groups. So the places where people go when this is happening to them, they say like, help me, what can I do? Um, the AEMP has gathered actually much more accurate and more contextualized data about the scope of the problem in the Bay Area. And in the book, we talk about the real value of what is gained by this process of embracing pluralism, by listening to people who are directly connected to the problems that we're seeking inter to intervene in and bringing them to the design table, not collecting data from outside, but bringing the voices of people who are impacted directly to the design process. So I have a... Uh, a final series of examples before we get to uh, the Q&A. And I sort of wanna mark the fact that the previous examples have focused primarily on the issues that come up when you're talking about power and people. So, you know, people who have power and then people who don't. But another major idea that comes from feminism relates to more conceptual structures of power and more specifically to binary structures that are defined by a hard distinction between two groups. So feminist theory has helped to show that these binary distinctions are usually hiding a hierarchy with one group on top and the other on the bottom. And then once you see the hierarchy, you start to understand why the hard line between those two groups is there in the first place. And why it's there is to ensure that the group on top is able to stay on top and the group on the bottom isn't able to sort of creep up and in. And you can probably already see where I'm going with this. So the distinction between the, you know, the idea of man and woman, this is the obvious reference point and was indeed the starting point for feminist theory um, because it's a clear example, both of a false binary and an unequal hierarchy, right? So there's more than two genders. And then among them, no gender is better than any of the others. 
But one of the key moves of feminist theorists is to take this critique of the gender binary and then use it to question other binaries and hi hierarchies that we encounter in the world. Um, so you could think of uh, feminist critiques, for example, of the distinction between nature and culture, right? You know, in this sort of our Anglo-Western context that we tend to have a hard line between what is natural um, and what is cultural or an artifact. This is why feminists like love a cyborg because it, it rejects that false binary. Um, in terms of teaching, we see feminist pedagogy intervene in the distinction between teacher and student, right? Um, so we have uh, theorists or theories of pedagogy saying, why is it that we automatically assume that the teacher should be on top and the student should be on the bottom when we know that in terms of who learns from whom, it is much more of an even exchange between teacher and student in the classroom. How about we dismantle that hierarchy and collapse that binary? But actually, uh, the binary that I want to talk about in the next example has to do with another uh, artificial distinction, um, and that has to do with the reason and emotion. So again, sort of in this Anglo-Western context in which most of us are placed, um, we've been taught that reason is somehow better than emotion. And we see this play out in data all the time, and it's particularly visible in data visualization. So you could just think about what you know about best practices for data visualization. Um, you know, a clean design, a minimalist aesthetic, presenting just the facts. But the question remains, you know, why are these our best practices? Especially when research has shown that we interpret these aesthetic choices just as emotionally. So we tend to believe that these types of charts are actually more truthful than they actually are. So I'm thinking right now of research by Jessica Holman. She's a computer science researcher at Northwestern. She's done user studies that show how just including a source line below a data visualization um, makes a person trust that visualization more. It doesn't matter whether the credit line actually links to a real source or not, but they see that line um, and they think, you know, ah, trustworthy. Interestingly, there's also been new research by Crystal Lee, um, a graduate student at MIT, and she studied the visualizations employed by uh, spreaders of misinformation or disinformation about COVID. And she's discovered that people who promote uh, totally apocryphal or made up facts about COVID on Facebook, Twitter, and the like, often accompany them with very official looking charts because they know the rhetorical power of an objective seeming or a scientific seeming chart. And so even though they've totally falsified all of the data that they are sharing, they present it in this seemingly neutral and objective way. So I wanna think a little bit about the opposite of this. So visualizations that deliberately leverage emotion. So this is what the next example that you see helps us explore. So what you're looking at on the screen is actually screenshots of an animated visualization. Um, it's by the design firm Periscopic. And actually, if you feel like watching it as I'm speaking, that's totally fine. You can Google it. It's called, um, I actually think it's just called US Gun Deaths. Um, and the URL is actually up here. I don't know if you can see my cursor when I'm mousing in this particular configuration. In any case, um, if you're watching or if you're, if you're not, what you would see is an animated visualization of the number of gun-related deaths in a particular calendar year. So um, each of the people killed by a gun in that year is represented as a single arc on the screen. And that's what you see in the smaller screenshots. Um, the arcs are traced one by one onto the screen. They start out slow and they get faster and faster until they start to overlap and create the semicircular web that you see um, in the larger image. And it's really, it's quite overwhelming to watch. It actually, it's sort of viscerally unbearable, but that's kind of the point, right? It goes on for too long because there are too many people being killed by guns in the United States. There's too much data plotted on the chart Again, because too many people are being killed by guns in the United States. It's supposed to feel like too much because there is too much violence. Now, it's also important to say that methodologically, it's no less statistically sound than any other study. So the data about the people derived from a national crime data set, um, their projected lifespans are determined using a pretty sophisticated statistical model that was released and, or developed and released by the World Health Organization. But it was viewed with intense suspicion from the visualization community because it made us feel things. 
And a feminist approach here would say, that's not a problem at all that it made us feel things. And actually it's a more compelling visualization precisely because it blends reason with emotion. It refuses that false binary. Now, oops, excuse me. If you allow yourself to rebalance reason with emotion, um, what this does, I'm just gonna get back to my slide here. If it will let me click. See if I can do some arrows, there we go, okay. Um, what this does is it really opens up the data communication toolbox box that allow and allows you to focus on what really matters in any sort of design process. So honoring the context surrounding the data, the lives that it represents. And if your goal is to take action, using every possible tool in that toolbox in order to encourage your viewers, your readers, your students, your researchers, you know, to take away the point of the work that you do, which is to compel people towards taking action to achieve a more just or more equitable future. So if it's not already apparent, the principles of data feminism apply to every single stage of a data science project, from inception and funding, to production and circulation, to impact in the world. You know, if you can see the slide, I don't know if you're watching this on small screens, if the question is, when do you make it a data science feminist? The answer is all the time and everywhere in the pipeline. And this brings me really to my final major point that I wanna make before the Q&A, which in a way I think is obvious from the examples that I'm sh I've shared, but it's that data feminism insists on an expanded definition of data science. So our data science isn't defined by the size of the data set or the prestige of the credentials of the people undertaking this work because these concerns are continually used to exclude women and people of color from the field, as well as to exclude work which makes a contribution that is socio-technical rather than purely technical. But if we expand our definition of data science, then we can clearly see that some of the most exciting work in data science today is being undertaken by artists, by journalists, by humanists, by community organizers, by activists, and sure, you know, some of this work does look like traditional data science. So I just, you know, up, I have a couple of screenshots up on the screen and I wanted to give a shout out, for instance, in the top left, this is work by uh, Dr. Margaret Mitchell uh, until very recently of Google's ethical AI team. She does really interesting work on bias and natural language processing. Um, but then next to her is a sculpture created by the artist Stephanie Dinkins. This is actually an interactive AI object that was trained on a series of conversations that Dinkins had between members, uh, multiple generations uh, of members in her family. You can walk up to the sculpture and interact with it and communicate with it in a way that reflects the, the heritage of Stephanie's family. She, she's African-American. Um, and then on the right, you see a visualization of uh, gender bias in Hollywood screenplays created by the data journalism outfit, The Pudding. And they do a lot of sort of fun and quirky data-driven investigations of popular culture. And then on the very bottom, you see a mural. This is actually uh, what, a, what the group Data Therapy describes as a data mural. What they do is they go into communities, they work with communities to analyze their own data, um, and then they figure out what is important in that data set. They figure out how they want it to be visualized. And then the project culminates by actually creating through paint or what have you, um, a mural that represents the data that reflects that particular community. And I wanted to end with these examples because they help to drive home the point that we try to make in the book, which is, you know, absolutely, data today is at the root of so many of the problems that we face right now. And you can think back to where we started talking about all of the biased algorithms, these oppressive data-driven systems, the ones that discriminate through failing to account for all sorts of issues before they're sort of unleashed on the world. But data, when intentionally collected, when deliberately deployed can also be part of the solution. And so that's actually one of the major takeaways that we try to instill in the book. So just a couple of uh, final notes before we um, 
segue over into the Q&A. Um, one is that if you uh, liked what you heard and you want a way of remembering what these principles are, we actually worked with a designer, Marcia Diaz, and we created these uh, infographics of the data feminism principles and then some individual postcard graphics for each principle. Um, these are available for free in five different languages in Korean, French, Spanish, and Portuguese in addition to English. And we also have a couple more languages in the works, uh, Greek, Turkish, Mandarin, um, and one more that I am forgetting. But if you go to uh, this bit.ly link, data feminism infographics, you can download those. Um, and then the final thing is just to be in touch. Um, you can find more information about the book at datafeminism.io. Um, there are, let's see, there is a lot, a lot of different ways to get in touch with both me and Catherine. We're on the web, um, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on GitHub. Um, um, and so that's all I have for my formal remarks. I'm really curious to hear your responses and your questions and your ideas. Thank you, Lauren. That, that was a wonderful um, presentation. And so I just want to remind everybody, if you have a question, please submit to Q&A, which is a button at the bottom of your screen. Shelly, I was wondering, so my mouse actually just, the battery stopped working just at this moment. And so I can't <laughs> stop my screen. I was wondering, could you stop my screen for me? <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll stop. That was a presentation first. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Okay, so I see some questions start coming. Um, Lauren, I will read it to you, but I probably you can see it on the screen as well. Okay, first question, as metadata and the data librarians, working in an academic setting, what is the first actionable step in undertaking this work and seeing our data through a feminist lens? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, one of the interesting roles that metadata and data librarians have is that they encounter data at the point that it usually has, well, I would like, I, I don't know that much about the process, but my sense is that you encounter when it's already been collected, right? And you're sort of encountering it and you're seeing what the metadata tags are. You're helping people to figure out the appropriate metadata to tag certain data sets with. Um, so I'll, I'll address my question, um, the, my response first to that, and then I'll sort of move backwards. And obviously if you do have input into how the data is collected, the types of expertise that those of you listening have, I think is really invaluable because usually what happens is you get to the point where the data has been collected, then people realize that they fail to categorize it or collect it in a way that really does capture everything that they were hoping to understand um, about a particular data set. So if you're absolutely, I, I would love to see much more uh, library and data professional involvement in the data collection effort. So that's um, one thing. But I do think that one thing that you can do is think really hard about these inherited standards um, in categories that you get from elsewhere and you apply to your data set um, and make sure that, again, that they are capturing everything that you are hoping to capture about that data set and that they are appropriate. And sometimes they can be changed. And sometimes they can't be changed, right? You know, the things that I'm most familiar with, for instance, are the subject headings at the Library of Congress, right? Which many of them are old, they use archaic language. Um, and sometimes, you know, after lobbying efforts, they can be changed, but sometimes they can't, right? And so really the most important thing is to be aware of that. And I think to be aware of the limitations in the categories that you may be using, the metadata tags, you know, if you're using some sort of inherited controlled vocabulary, sort of what is available to you and being open about that so that it can either be accounted for in any subsequent analysis or it can be changed in the future. So that's, I think that's what that I, what I would say about that. I'm not sure if um, anyone has a follow-up question along those lines. Cause again, I'm sort of, I'm speaking as a uh, domain expert or researcher who often <laughs> avails myself of, of data librarian and metadata librarian resources. 
Thank you. The next question, I think this one might be um, easier. What is the title of the book? I assume it's a book you and Catherine co-authored. Yes, yes. It's called Data Feminism. Okay. Okay, next question is a little bit long. Um, I will try to read it. Hopefully I can convey the, what the main the ask the, the question is. First of all, it says, wonderful talk, thank you. My question has to do with naming. Given the power of dynamics that are hypostatized in the act of naming things, I'm curious about how you and you co-author co decided on data feminism as the overarching category through which such inter, uh, intersection, intersectional factors as anti-racism and anti-classism can be expressed and analyzed? Yeah, I think that's a really good question and I, I appreciate it. And I will say, you know, we chose data feminism and to sort of focus our approach through feminism because feminism very broadly conceived, and this goes back to the sort of definitions that I was offering at the beginning. So both sort of feminist theory, um, feminist activism and feminist critical thought more generally, all of these ways of thinking have been heavily influential for my and Catherine's own approach to our work. Um, and so it was never a question not for us not to name it feminism, because this was how we saw, I mean, we really felt like there was a need to take what we had learned from feminist teachings broadly and show how they could be applied to data science in order to make it better. Um, we were very insistent that it be an intersectional feminist approach for two reasons. One is because intersectional feminism, as I said at the beginning of the talk, really is the source for all sorts of feminist critiques of power, right? So if you want to move beyond questions of identity, categorization, classification, and to sort of widen your focus to be, think about the root causes for the inequalities and the injustices that show up in these systems, you need to be taking, you need to be thinking about power, you need to be taking an intersectional approach. Um, and so that was what brought us to intersectional feminism theoretically. Um, and I would just say responding to the current reality of data systems, what we saw as some of the most pressing and urgent forms of oppression that are induced by these systems have to do, in, in a US context, I should say, um, which is where Catherine and I are both based, have to do with the intersection of race and gender. And so it was important to us that we had an analytic that captured that. You know, with all that said, we are not the only people theorizing or writing about how humanistic thinking, how culture, how context can be brought to bear on data practices. You know, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with, for instance, ideas around indigenous data sovereignty. And I think there's a lot of really powerful ideas about indigenous ways of thinking about data and cultural knowledge production in general can be brought to bear on data. And in fact, already have been, right, through many works, not our own. Similarly, there's a lot of terrific work on queer data, um, thinking about how queer frame frameworks for looking at um, employing, refusing data um, have real relevance broadly in the world today. And, you know, as well, and I, I could go on. I mean, I think that there's all, the, the point I think is just that data is not an abstruse, and I think all of you listening know this, like data is not an abstruse technical concept that has no connections to the other ways in which we learn how to understand and critique culture. On the contrary, all of the things that we know how to think about culture, all the th different ways that we know how to sort of critique and strive and improve um, our cultural record, these also apply to data. So um, maybe I'll, I'll end up there. Okay, so uh, next question is, um, I'm the person says, I'm curious to hear about your comments on and the suggestions for counteracting the negative implications and effects of data sexism and high ad funding and academic programs. Huh. And, you know, I'm not, I'm actually not certain what is meant by data sexism. Um, and I wonder if the 
question asker would be willing to clarify that a little bit, um, or I could just talk a little bit about uh, generally sort of sexism and metrics with respect to uh, funding and higher ed and things like this, because that certainly is operative. Um, Shelley, do you, have a, do you have a thought about that? Okay, so um, the person who submit the question um, is, let me see, I think this keep jumping, um, is Erica, would you mind to unmute and ask your question or give additional information? Oh, I see. That. Okay, so there's a, there's an additional comment. My my intention in calling it data sexism was a, an opposite to data feminism. Ah, okay, okay, I get it now. <laughs> I'm gonna fi I'm gonna file that one away. Um, so I mean, I think you know, it's we know that there are incredibly unequal. You know, all of these programs are incredibly tilted towards those and dominant groups, right? Um, we see this in the way in which grants are awarded and which um, programs do their hiring and which programs do their uh, recruitment, retention, all of these things and the students who are accepted into these programs. I mean, I think it really is a systemic problem and it's one that needs to be acknowledged. And I think that, you know, if I had to say what the solution would be, um, you know, I think that the solution is like, everything all the time, always. So this means both intentionally bringing people into these funding selection committees, um, into hiring media, media, uh, committees, into leadership um, in ways that allows their expertise um, on issues relating to gender and other topics, uh, which may be pursued by people who either are or are not part of those groups. Um, you know, because these are related but different issues. One sort of is the representation question, and the other is the the issues of research. But bringing people into positions of power so that they can help guide the conversations about what projects look like that can be funded. Oh, my daughter, speaking of, is coming to say hello. Um, you're in the middle of a conference. I'll be done very soon in about ten minutes. Can you give me a little bit more time? No. Um, please, I don't have an option other than finishing my talk. Thank you. Can you close the door? Um, and I think also sort of at the individual level, doing what we can to recognize uh, really excellent projects, even in their early phases and amplify them. If we can lend support, resources, mentorship. I think those of us or those of you who work in libraries have the ability sometimes to find out about student projects, about projects in their nascent phases um, and give them a little bit more love so that they can be brought to the phase where they're competitive for larger uh, grants and funding opportunities. Um, you know, try to lead by example, right? Like take a look at your own teams. Like who are you hiring? What projects are you endorsing? What students do you hire? What are your criteria for student workers? You know, like all of these things are things that we can do. And again, I don't think it's like an either or situation. The problem is bad. And actually one of the really interesting things about, I happen to, I know more a little bit about um, gender data and uh, racial representation in technical fields. I'm not sure if it's the same for library fields, but the ratio of essentially like white men to all other groups in technical fields was improving and it's since getting worse. And so even in spite of all these conversations that we're having about increased equity, increased access, fixing the pipeline, all of these things, none of these things are working well at all because numbers are getting lower rather than higher. Okay, there's a couple of follow-up question. I think this is related to first question about as a metadata librarian and what actions. So this one says, as a follow-up to that, would the protocols like those proposed in um, Timnit Gabriel, I think this might be one of the persons discussed in your book, uh, et cetera, as data sheets for data sets be the kind of ways we should be looking at documenting those limitations in vocabulary or data collection. Other ways to document this in library data sets. So yeah, I again, love... Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. 
uh, I said again, it's just I think uh, many of many of us doing the metadata description, and we try to be objective and also through the all the sorts of um, diversity and the equity and the uh, inclusiveness lens to go through those. But I think sometimes we feel we still need more guidance. <laughs> Yeah, well, I so that paper that was mentioned, I love that paper. So this is a paper, uh, Dr. Timnit Gebri was the lead author. It came out of when she was at Microsoft. It's, it's a bunch of Microsoft research people. If you Google it, it's on archive um, and you can find it. And what this is, it's a paper, it's five or six pages and it's a series of structured sets of questions that you can ask about the data that you're working with. It's intended for users of data, but I absolutely think that it would be um, a really interesting model to attach to a data set. Um, I actually have, I often use that in my teaching and I have my students work through those questions because usually they actually are finding a data set that they have not themselves collected to then analyze. Um, but these, absolutely, these are the types of models that I would love to see appended to data sets that enter institutional repositories that researchers collect and intend to be shared or distributed beyond the scope of the project. I think it's 100% um, it is totally necessary to have this additional context and to have it created by to the best in the the people who the people closest to the data, right? Sometimes it is the data librarian because the data has long been collected and deposited. Ideally, it would be the people collecting the data themselves. There are some different types of models there. Bob Gradak, who's at the, I think it's, what's his organization called? It's, he, it's like the, Pis, the Pittsburgh, he's in Pittsburgh, I think. Um, but he runs a, an open data sort of store. And he has something called data user guides, which are slightly less structured, but the same kind of concept. It's like, what do you need to know in order to use this data if you yourself did not collect it? Um, you know, what does it contain? What does it omit? And under what conditions was it collected, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a version, Heather Krauss has something called a data biography. Um, but again, it's, there's different versions of the same thing, but it's essentially how can we attach context that describes the process of data collection um, so that that accompanies the data themselves as they travel into repositories and into future research? Because I do think that it's so, so important, not just for documentation processes, but also ideally so that the data can be used in the most effective way in the future. Yeah, well, it's great. Thank you. Uh, again, next one is also um, as a follow up to you mentioned about subject headings. We can use describing the metadata, uh, describing the data sets, and so on. So this question is thinking about linked data subject headings. For example, Library of Congress subject heading. Given that it takes long periods of time to change anything uh, in a patriarch and a um, colonialism system, do you think it's worth it to spend the time in revision, in revision those large system and risk burning? Or do you think it's better to just construct a new alternative systems? That's a really good question. Um, and I, I, I'm gonna caveat this by saying, I am not an expert in this space, um, but I actually do think that it is worth spending time invested in revising these systems, especially ones that have a very long history and that are widely used. Um, because as we know, they are patriarchal and they are colonialist and they will continue to be used, right? Um, and I know, I mean, the, the area that I know the most about, again, has to do with Library of Congress subject headings. And I know that there's been work over the years to revisit and revise some of those naming conventions. And that matters, you know, people notice uh, when those changes are made. I think that, you know, what I would advocate for, and absolutely like, you know, again, one of the sort of core feminist principles is that you are rarely confronted with an either or choice in the world. Like usually, you can do a both and. 
And so I'm thinking of an example. I'm trying to remember the exact name of it, but in New Zealand, I know there's been work done towards Maori knowledge or uh, subject headings by the New Zealand National Library. And these subject headings, I believe, are used alongside whatever the New Zealand National subject headings are. Um, and this is a situation where objects just have two sets of headings, right? And you can enter one way or you can enter it the other way, depending on your intended, you know, how you're hoping to navigate through the collection. And I think the thing that I'll just say about the, the Maori subject headings is I really like how they were established. And I actually have no idea if this exists with respect to um, English language or US-based heading systems. Um, there was essentially like a council of experts that advised on the construction of the, the headings. And I would I could imagine a similar body that sort of takes its charge as revising or updating or examining or dealing with issues um, with headings that have are now realized to be uh, colonialist or patriarchal or you know racist or whatever you might be. Um, oh, thank you for the link. Yeah, that's absolutely what I'm talking about. Um, and um, and I, I don't know if this exists. I would love to see this because again, you know, dismantling the patriarchy decolonizing library systems requires all methods employed by everyone who has the bandwidth, you know, to do these things all at once, right? And the hope is that from both sides, you eventually sort of meet at some systems uh, that represent in way in meaningful um, and respectful ways the, the culture, her cultural heritage that you have. Thank you. I think your answer somehow make me thought about the wonderful principle you mentioned about seven principles. One is called uh, embracing the um, pluralism. So which means, I mean, besides something you feel you have to use, you can also supplement. Oh no, Shelby. Oh, Shelby, I'm coming back. You... Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I realized that I lost. Okay, so I don't know where I was cut off. You were talking about one of the principles, embracing pluralism, and uh -huh. then you cut off. Okay, so do you think that's something, instead of dismantle whatever system we're using, we could just supplement with for example, you talk about New Zealand, sort of subject headings they use, probably in addition to type of Congress subject heading. Yeah, I mean, I think ideally you would also, at the same time that you're, it I would think of it less of a supplement, although obviously it would have to start because it is smaller, you know, in that form. But ideally you would want to sort of dismantle that hierarchy too, right? So if people, you know, if the way, if the, there, there should be a sort of equal and equivalent entry point that does reflect this other way of structuring knowledge, I think that would be um, the ideal in it as you work to revise whatever sort of dominant system that you have. But again, I think there's, you know, people tend to think that, you know, pluralism is scary, that multiple entry points is scary, that we should have a single way of doing things. <laughs> and yet what I think, you know, what feminism teaches us and what living in the world teaches us is that it's rarely a bad idea to have multiple ideas coming to the same problem or the same table or the same challenge, right? Okay, I think we probably have uh, time for one more question, but there's still uh, many questions remain to be answered. So I just want to mention um, after program, people feel, please feel free to use uh, our Slack channel, uh, general, it's labeled as general, submit the question and hopefully, and Lauren will be able to answer through that channel as well. Okay, so let me read the last one. Um, from the live session. Um, as a follow-up to that, oh, sorry, I think that one is already answered. Uh, the next one is the description, description of your talk includes statement that data never ever speak for themselves. Uh, the idea of the linked data seem in conflict with that statement. 
because for the linked data, we can basically encode relationships and the meanings in semantic web to be understand, to be understood anywhere, anytime by, by other humans and the machine. Could you comment on that? Oh, I love that question. Um, I mean, I think that that is, you know, I think that's a tricky one. And I would say, you know, it's not, there's two things going on. So the idea of the data never speaking for themselves, this comes from the idea that essentially all eventually we will be able to amass enough data that it will sufficiently reflect the world's population that we will no longer need to extrapolate from any data that we have because any problem is itself contained within the data. Um, so, and then we sort of draw that out to make an argument just about the importance of context and sort of in larger or difficult to quantify forces, issues, you know, other sorts of things that are happening outside the data that are of course always present. I mean, I think what I would say with respect to linked data is that hopefully this throws into relief the tremendous responsibility that comes with the decision to, you know, determine a relationship or associate, you know, say this particular name is a name or is a person and this type of person is that is part of that type of group. You know, all of these decisions should not be undertaken lightly um, because they do travel with the data set, right? And I think some of these things are more obvious than others, but my hope is that at the moment when you find yourself making a choice or making a decision, you stop to think like, is this something that is you know, universally true for this particular item that I am dealing with, or is it something that might, you know, be true in certain contexts, and if so, maybe this isn't exactly a relationship that I should um, permanently assign, or maybe there are multiple ones, um, or things like that. I mean, with that said, I mean, I do think that there is a point, which is linked data is a really useful thing to have, and it enables much more knowledge about a data set or a particular object or item um, than if it were not, you know, formatted in a linked data way. Um, and yet, it in, itself, in, it in and of itself does not give you all the information about the information that the data is trying to encode, right? And so there's always, you know, obviously whether your record, you know, tells you what kind of a person it is or what entity they're associated with, or, you know, whether it comes with this additional information or not, that isn't all of the information you need to know before you, you put this data to use. Um, and so I would say that's sort of the alignment with the argument that the data don't, don't speak for themselves, that, that there's always contextual information that can't be captured by the data. Um, and again, this isn't to say like, don't use it, right? Because more information is better than less information, but we also need to be aware that more information is not all information, right? And that's always true, so. Okay, uh, we have still three questions open, but what we'll do is we will post those questions to Slack channel. Uh, as I said, we will post it to the general um, sub channel of our Slack channel, play, uh, the place. Um, so thank you so much for the wonderful talk and thank you for the people who submitted those um, excellent, very engaging questions. And I'm speaking personal experience, I feel like I learned a lot from this session, not just about linked data, but that in terms of how we're looking at data, how we curate the data, describing the data has a huge impact down the road. So this is wonderful. Thank you so much, Lauren. And also thank, thanks to everybody who participated. And if you are interested and please send more questions uh, through the Slack channel. And I saw Michelle's message. Uh, there's a lot of additional resources Lauren mentioned during the talk. And those links we were going to be posted as well. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. I just put a quick link in the chat to that question about data refusal. There's another resource, not my own, that, that takes up that issue. And I'll definitely look to the Slack for um, more of the questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.